Uh, first off, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. It's, uh, I'm going to talk about a, a bunch of interesting work that other people did and that I was present for. You know, those are all the names listed at the bottom, all of the various students of myself and Jeff Volker and Vern Paxson who've uh, come along with us on this journey. Uh, so I'm going to start by just giving a little bit of context to explain how we ended up thinking of cybercrime as, <clears throat> as an actual research topic. And so uh, as, uh, uh, as I said in my introduction, I direct this, this funny center called the Collaborative Center for Internet Epidemiology and Defenses, which we thought we were being very uh, slick because the acronym would be pronounced seaside and we all lived on the coast and that would be, no one gets that. Um, but the, you know, acronyms are uh, ever present in computer science. This was founded in response to the computer worm threat that emerged kind of at the early 21st century. Code red, these kinds of things. All of a sudden we had large numbers of computers being taken over um, by a single piece of malware. And in response to this threat, we obtained a lot of funding from the federal government. We got a lot of companies who came in. And so we had a research plan that I will outline here and then tell you why it was wrong. Uh, so our research plan had two primary components. We said we're going to study, and it, this is where we get the title from, internet epidemiology, which was the study of the spread of these uh, viruses and malware and botnets and so forth, and we were going to measure how they spread and how effectively they could spread, what were the limits and so forth. And then we were going to build defenses against those same things. Instead of simply studying them, we were going to make life better. And that's really what we were going to do, because we were hardcore, you know, technical people. And so we were going to solve hardcore technical problems. But we had to put a, a proposal into the National Science Foundation. And they have this thing called broader impacts. And so we had to have some wishy-washy stuff about economics and sociology and legal issues. And, we're, and we, so we have, I still have the paragraphs that we put in that were total lip service. And we brought someone in at part time who was going to like give us the checkbox for our broader impacts. And so this talk is really about why that was the important stuff and all this other stuff we did was actually, while intellectually interesting, actually had no impact at all. All right. So as I explained how we had no impact, we were tremendously successful by the metrics of our community. In the sense, we had huge numbers of papers. You know, we did about 50 papers in this space. We built really big systems. A bunch of these still run. So the UCSD Network Telescope monitors 1% of all routable addresses on the internet. If you do anything that has random address selection, we see it. Uh, we still have probably the largest collection of honeypots in existence with about a quarter of a million uh, virtual machines active on the internet. We built things that could recognize worm signatures in under a millisecond. These got rolled out to startup companies and then to Cisco. By all of the metrics that we count research success, um, we were successful, and then, after having done this for four or five years, you step back and say, well, did we stop the attackers? And not so much. I mean, the fact of the matter was, you know, for all of our success, things weren't getting better. They were getting worse. This is one of those kind of Ronald Reagan moments. Are you more secure than you were four years ago? No. You know? So we didn't stop worms, and we didn't stop malware, and we didn't stop e-crime. And it wasn't that we were so lousy. It was that no one was accomplishing anything in this space. We weren't getting anything done. And so the realization that we came to is that one of the key flaws was looking at this as a technical problem, or as purely a technical problem, a problem that you could solve by finding an individual technical uh, flaw and then fixing it through some application of technology. All right. And there are a number of reasons for this, and it's because we have set ourselves up in a game with our adversaries in which we singularly play the role of the, the attacker without thinking of the structure of the game that we've established. So I'm going to talk about some of the asymmetries that exist today in this game. So the first asymmetry is what we call uh, the initiative asymmetry, and that is that defenders are primarily reactive. And this goes for everything from malware to spam to denial of service. It doesn't matter. The def as your role as the defender is when a new attack comes out, you need to come up with a new defense. And attackers, on the other hand, can attack proactively whenever they feel like it. And the consequence of this is our defenses are public, and attackers 
basically can take their time as to where to place an attack and can do so in a way that they know it will be successful. So I'll give you a really simple example. What is the catch rate, the success rate of detecting new malware from your favorite antivirus vendor? Zero. By definition, it is zero. And the reason it is zero is because they, the bad guys, have the antivirus programs. And in fact, there's a half dozen underground uh, companies, for want of a better word, that will happily test your new malware and tell you which antivirus programs will detect it, and then you perturb it until none of them detect it. And that's when you release your malware. So antivirus catch rate is a function of how much of the stuff that's been around for a while do people detect. New stuff can't be detected. So our best situation in this place is, is to play, play catch-up, is that we are going to somehow uh, try to keep pace, be about as fast as them. All right. So another problem we have is in innovation. It is expensive to create new defenses. It is expensive on a number of different fronts. One is that it's actually expensive to hire programmers to do this kind of stuff. Defending against a new attack is invariably harder than coming up with it. But it's also, defensive, uh, it's also expensive structurally. So we have sunk business models. If you're in the firewall space, that's what you do. And you don't do something else. So when, when uh, people first started coming up with drive-by downloads, where you'd visit a web page and it would take over your machine, if you were to talk to an antivirus vendor, they would say, that's not my problem. That's not a virus. I don't do that. And so you have two years where people come up with a new thing called web security. And so this dirty secret number one of the security industry is that there are only two forces that drive innovation. Force number one is bad guys, because bad guys create value by demonstrating to your customers that it would be worthwhile for you to buy a product to deal with that problem. And the other driver is regulators. And if you do not have a bad guy or a regulator driving your innovation, there is no innovation. All right. Attackers could care less. Any new thing that they can come up with, as soon as they can break something well enough that it mostly works some of the time, they can take over machines this way. Then we have a different incentive structure. Uh, I won't say very much about this because I think it's well known. We don't have a very strong deterrent model because we have uh, functional anonymity for most of the internet. And if, it's, if we don't have pure anonymity, we have the problem of international borders with different, uh, with different rules of law with respect to internet activities. On the security side, unfortunately, our incentives are not naturally aligned uh, in that security itself is rarely a key competitive product, even a key competitive offering, even of a security product. All right? And the reason for that comes down to the last issue, which is evaluation. We have no idea how to measure defenses. Right? So pick your favorite security product. It can be a firewall. It can be AV. It can be you know, whatever it is. How many units of security does it offer more than its closest competitor? Is it six units better? We have no idea. We don't know how to measure that, right? So the consequence of this is this dirty uh, security industry secret number two is that the security industry, by and large, competes on every aspect of their product offering other than the security that they offer. Because they can't compete on security. There is no way for them to convince a customer that their offering is more secure other than rhetoric. Um, attackers have a great way to measure how, how much better their attacks are. Do they make more money? Very simple model. Right? It's just like Amazon. Right? They rearrange the web page. It's a great user interface if it makes more money. Right? Same for the bad guys. If they make more money, it's working well. All right. so, we as researchers are faced with the, the game that we have been dealt, and so now what should you do about security? And there are a variety of philosophies about what we should do. One is uh, what I'll call the clean slate approach. Uh, this is viewing security as a form of math, that there is an axiomatic basis. Once we get all of the principles, we can prove system security. If we just did it right from scratch, everything would be secure, and we wouldn't have any problems. And um, I'm really happy that lots of people are doing this. Uh, I think it only goes so far, and it's really hard. It only goes so far because we never know, understand how to do the axiomatic basis for people. And ultimately, security involves people, both on the victim side and the attacker side. 
Uh, it also turns out to be really hard because it's just it's really hard, even for well-defined problems, to come up with a, 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 a complete proof structure that we can say something is absolutely true. Nevertheless, this is a great approach. People have been working on it for 20, 30 years. It keeps getting better. All right. The other approach is security as engineering. All right. The, so look, security is one of the many properties that we offer. Um, if you give more resources to the security property instead of the you know, spinning button property or, or time to market property of it, then it will be more secure. Give us more money and we will make your systems more secure. And this is true, right? And in the time that I started speaking, Google probably hired four security people, all right? So this is happening. Uh, it is probably, it is not necessarily the case that this, we know exactly how to spend those people uh, in an effective way. All right, and so the last one, which is the one that I think gets short shrift that I'm gonna talk about today is security as social science. And that is, rather than thinking of ourselves as victims against some abstract adversary, we should reflect on the fact that we actually have adversaries who have known goals. And in fact, we may know quite a bit about our adversaries. Uh, and that we can, by understanding them and what their drivers are, can figure out what kinds of interventions would actually make sense, which would be the most effective. Okay. So let's go back and see how do we spend money today. Depending on whose BS numbers you believe, we spend globally somewhere between 50 and 100 billion dollars on IT security worldwide. All, the vast majority of this money is spent on securing the end host, right? Securing your laptop, securing your desktop, securing the server, making sure that no attacker gets their grubbly little paws, gets some point of purchase on that host, and that's AV, firewall, that's code review, IDS, all of the things, all of every product category you've heard of is pretty much in this space. The downside with this being where we choose to fight this battle, um, this is by far the most expensive uh, front that we could ever choose to secure. Why? Because we got a couple billion of these things, and because they are administered by all of the people in the world according to their own whims about how they should be administered. Um, so if we turn it around and say, okay, this is where we're spending all of our money, how valuable is an arbitrary end host to the actual bad guy. If a bad guy had to go out and buy an end host, you know, we, when I buy my PC, just day one, it comes with like $40 of security product invested in it. How much was that worth to the bad guys? Well, so you can find out, you can go. You can go online, there are about a dozen sites in what's called the paper install market, um, where you can pay for, to have your software installed on hosts such that you've taken them over. This is one from a couple years ago called Installs for uh, Sale. And they have price lists as a function of the country. So what you can see, I'm not going to expect you to, uh, to read it because uh, it's in Russian, but you know, by USA it says $130, and down there in the bottom it says Asia, it's about $10. And that's not per host, that's per thousand hosts. Okay? That's per thousand hosts. So 10 cents is how much your machine is worth, and if you were in China, your machine would be worth one cent. Right? So that's, that's how much it matters to them. Right? So there is an incongruity in how we are valuing these assets because we don't actually understand what they are valuable for to the bad guy. Now, you say, well, we're moving to the cloud, so who cares about the end host? Well, what about your account? Like, what if I wanted to buy your Yahoo account or your Gmail account? Same thing. So, and these prices are out of date. They're a little bit, uh, they're a little bit off. These days, for, say, a Hotmail account, about $5 per thousand. All right, per thousand. Google is a little bit more. These are out of date. I can talk about later. Google's now up to about 40 bucks. Um, they've done some things that made it more expensive. But that's a case of an intervention that actually addresses the underlying cost structure. All right, so the position that our group has come to take over some time is that for a vast class of attacks, we need to understand the economics of the adversary if we are going to come up with interventions that make sense. Right? Otherwise, we're just blindly sticking our fingers in holes hoping that things get better. The idea is maybe we would be guided by some knowledge of what would cause impact. Uh, the other claim that I'll make <laughs> is that this, the first part sounds good and you can do it really badly very easily. So bad economic data is worse than no data at all. And so security is perhaps the worst space uh, in computer science with respect to people making numbers up. So if you were to read, for example, the report from the office of the president about the cost of cybercrime, they will tell you it is a trillion dollar industry, all right? Um, more than the GDP of Germany, in fact. I mean, come on, who reads this stuff? How, does no one crap detect any of this stuff? Um, 
So you know, the, the argument that we're going to make is that you actually need to measure these things. You can't just like, take three sample points and draw a line. And so uh, you need an empirical evidence basis in order to make claims about what we should be doing. All right. So here's how the rest of the talk of, uh, today is going to go. Um, I'm first going to give you kind of a really quick rough sketch about what the kind of internet criminal ecosystem looks like. And then I'm going to do uh, th three kind of brief case studies based on work that we've done trying to do exactly what the purpose of this talk is, which is to put some empirical footing on understanding the economics of the adversary. In this particular case, I'm going to focus largely on the spam ecosystem because it's what we know the best. In service to the goal of being able to say something sensible about what to do about the problem. OK. So um, to take, uh, go back a step, all of this really comes out of three really big changes that happened in the 21st century that are all really come out of the internet. Uh, once we get uh, pervasive internet connectivity, it means that it is now feasible for any device to talk to any other device. That means that because of a combination of homogeneity um, and basically users clicking on any fool thing that you give them, it is possible for you to compromise hosts uh, at scale. So starting in 99, people demonstrate, hey, we can take over 100,000 hosts about as easily as we can take over one, changes the dynamic. Then after people realize that they can centralize the control of those large numbers of hosts that have been compromised through botnets, which is basically they repurposed IRC chatbots, is the, is the history of this, that now they actually can use those as an aggregate resource and then the third part is that people take that aggregate resource and they realize how to make a profit out of it. So either a profit on the commodity resources of the machines that have been compromised, so its IP address, or the unique resources that it have, like your MasterCard number. All right. And so the way this happens is it basically 2004, um, 2004 is this banner year where the, the one outfit that's really making money on the internet in some quasi-criminal way, which is the spammers, run into trouble because members of our own community are very successful at shutting them down through blacklists. So we are able to say, oh, that host sends a lot of spam, let's not accept mail from them, and that works, and that cuts into the underlying profit. These guys hook up with the people who have figured out how to do mass compromise, and this is one of those Reese's peanut butter cup moments where they said, hey, I need a whole lot of machines to launder my source address, and you have money. Why don't I give you some of that money and you install proxies on your machines? And so we start having uh, malware like SoBig and MyDoom that launders the origin for spam, and in, it, in turn gives money to the people who are doing this, who beforehand were doing it just for kicks. Right? They're really, the, none of the malware before this was really doing anything for any purpose. This, was a, this is an enormous change. This is the single biggest change that happened in terms of modern computer security, because it creates a virtuous economic cycle where the people who are building malware and building the support ecosystem around it are suddenly become profit motivated. If I do a better job, I can make more money. Um, I'm not going to give away my exploits for free. I'm not going to just put this thing out there. I'm going to make money at it, and I'm going to find as many buyers as I can, and I'm going to get my fair market price. What this ends up doing is it commoditizes compromised hosts. All right? And I mean this in exactly the way you think of commodities, pork bellies, right? We buy and sell compromised hosts in lots of a thousand on a fluid market where price changes based on supply and demand. You can buy raw bots like I showed you at you know, pennies a piece. You can buy value-added bots that have high bandwidth, high uptime. You can buy them in particular. You want, you want .mil bots? You, know, you can get those. You just have to pay more money. I mean, anything you can imagine buying, there are people selling. Then you get innovation both in that substrate, the botnet part that creates, that creates this, and in all of the uses and in the market around that. So the way I would encourage you to think about the way that this ecosystem works today is that the combination of being able to take over large numbers of hosts and compromise them and control them for a central location has effectively created a platform economy. They are the platform. Botnets are a platform. And all of the other stuff, spam, piracy, phishing, identity theft, DDoS, what have you, those are vertical applications that are built upon that platform. Because that is pretty much how this works. Uh, all right. So I'll just give you a couple examples of this market that has emerged. So you know, here's, uh, just to give you a flavor, here's an outfit that is selling uh, an exploit kit called Crime Pack. 
And Crime Pack is basically, it uh, codes up a bunch of exploits so you can take over machines and they advertise at the bottom that they get 39% success rate against uh, Internet Explorer 6 and 7. And they further will tell you it's $400 for a license. And they do not want you to pirate their software because, <laughs> and these guys have real problems with this kind of problem, as you might imagine, since they are selling to criminals. And so they've come up with very innovative solutions. So the, um, the industry leading uh, forum spammer is a product called Hroomer. And the way that they have dealt with rampant piracy is the author has widely distributed versions of his own software that are compromised with malware. So if you download a free version, you have to worry that you might get infected yourself. And this has actually been fairly effective. And he's kept his price high. He can demand $500. All right. Then there's the flip side of that place that was going to sell you compromised hosts, which is they'll buy, too. So the people who are selling you um, raw installs are buying. They're not actually doing any of the work. They say, look, you go and uh, take over hosts and install our binary on it, and we will pay you money for those, and then we will resell them to a third party. So they just act as middlemen. And so this is one of the outfits. They'll pay you $6 for Asian hosts, $180 for US hosts. Um, uh, this is the precursor, but this is my favorite one of all times. So this is an outfit called iframe dollars. And so the idea here is how do I make money off of you if you're a total dope, all right? But you have some access that I could monetize. In particular, let's suppose you have the password to the web server for your company or organization. So you could actually change the HTML on the home page. But you don't know how to write malware. You don't know how to monetize things. You don't know how to do credit card laundering. You don't know any of this stuff. So iframe dollars to the rescue. They say, look, take that little tiny piece of HTML code, put it in your web page. And it'll point to an iframe. And our iframe will have the latest and greatest web exploit that gets updated every eight hours, that cannot be detected by any fake AV, has every exploit that can take out browsers known to man. And then we will pay you a commission for everyone who visits your website and is then compromised as a result. So you don't need to know anything. This is outsourcing taken to its logical conclusion. I've taken this little capability you have, and I've found a way to monetize it and to incent you to use that capability. All right. uh, DDoS, uh, you can, now that you've taken over these machines, you can use them for various things. So you might use them for DDoS. Going rate for DDoS is $8. So WMZ is a, a, a figure for a kind of online currency called web money. Think of it as the Russian version of, uh, of PayPal. And uh, so these are denominated in dollars. So $8 to take something down for uh, uh, for an hour. Uh, these guys typically have sliding scale fee based on how big the site is. But maybe you want to steal credentials. You want to steal MasterCard numbers and, and Hotmail accounts and so forth. So these great information stealers like Zeus and SpyEye. But you might not know how to install them because you know software is hard. So there are consultancies. This outfit for $5 will install Zeus for you on machines that you have purchased from someone else and will manage the aggregation of data on your behalf. And as on the bottom where you see past the test, this is how these guys demonstrate reputation, is that they have reviews on well-known underground sites. And so you can see how other people's experience with their service has been in order to establish that they uh, do a good service. Um, or, you, so having stolen those, what are you going to do? Well, you can go to a carding site and you can buy and sell these stolen credit cards. So you know, here's $2 for a MasterCard, uh, $4 for Visa Business. And there are tons of these sites. It goes kind of on and on, and like kind of anything that you could imagine. It's like, it's like the Inuit. You know, no part of the whale is wasted. You know, we will suck every bit of value out of your machine. You could say, well, I'm going to get into the spam business, rent a spam bot. You know, there's tons of people who will rent you a spam bot. Well, how, who do, how am I going to get a mailing list? Well, for $4,000, you can buy 850 million valid email addresses. All right? So this is not a very tough business. And then, well, what am I going to sell with the spam? Well, there are these affiliate programs who will pay you on a commission basis for spamming their goods and services. So uh, oh, what was, oh, this is one I just wanted to share. So you have to host this stuff somewhere, because people come after you. So there's this whole ecosystem called bulletproof hosting. And bulletproof hosting basically is a hosting service where they will ignore complaints, right? <laughs> and what the, the term is called abuse. It's ironic. Abuse means complaints by good guys. All right. So, um, and so, but they have they have limits. So you'll notice here it says no child porn, no Nazi propaganda, no project aimed at breaking government organizations, and no bank scams, which means phishing for banks, except for our Iranian servers. And our Iranian servers, you can do 
bank scams. And this is actually incredibly common. So you can't do porn on the Saudi Arabian servers. You can't do certain things in other servers. And so they have a whole network that they've built up of these data centers where they have handshake agreements. And they will cite you. You say, here's the project I want to do. And they will cite you in the appropriate data center where they will bit bucket any complaint. And then finally, you know, if you want to build up the whole ecosystem, this is the kind of stuff we found only recently. There are companies that will just sell you companies. All right? We keep ready-made companies <laughs> in Panama for immediate delivery. For $1,200, you can buy a foundation, a tax-free foundation. My university has not yet agreed to let me buy one. But <laughs> I mean, it's just phenomenal what is out there. All right. So if we were to take a step back, because I only like there's like a three-hour version of this talk I can give with all the details. But there are like a lot of different moving pieces here. So we think of it in terms of two kinds of goods. There are goods that we call tier one goods, credit cards, bank accounts, things like that. You can value them directly. right? You know how much they're worth because it's how much money is in the instrument. And um, then there are tier two goods, bots, exploits, malware. These are things that have value, but only to other people in the underground economy. So they have internal value. They do not create any new value. They don't pull value from the outside. Um, so that's, and then there's, yeah, I'll leave MP MMPORGs out. Uh, then we have markets, and we like having markets because they are efficient. They keep prices down. They let you find the largest number of people to buy and sell. Um, then there are scams, which we describe as a combination of some of these with a capital investment. So you will take digital goods and that you've purchased and combine them with some value creation strategy, like spamming, um, in order to make new capital. Uh, and then finally, you have to get the money out at the end. And there are either indirect ways, uh, like spam, where you'll be paid on a commission basis through a legitimate sale, uh, or click fraud, uh, or pump and dump, where you'll uh, try to trade on the basis of stock price fluctuations, to direct ones, where you'll actually get someone to print new cards that have your uh, credit card number on them and try to take cash out of an ATM. All right. There's a lot going on here, but to a first approximation, there are only two value creation strategies that exist. And by value creation, I mean new value that gets brought into this system. Advertising, right? We should be familiar with this one. And theft, right? And so it's a spectrum, and so it's, sometimes it's hard to call. But for example, spamming Viagra, that's advertising. Because someone is going to go, they get this, it's an ad, they're going to spend money to buy a product. Right? That's an advertising activity. On the other hand, taking your credit card unbeknownst to you and stealing it or taking, doing an ACH transfer out of your bank account and transferring $20,000 out, that's just theft. Uh, and then there's stuff in between, like fake antivirus. You, per, you purchase it, but you are defrauded into doing it, and, and, and there's stuff in between. Then supporting all of this is infrastructure. So all of this supports, is supported by all of those other activities that I talked about to allow you to engage in some of these various scams that bring the new money in. All right, so yes, this was fun. You got to learn about various sexy underground things. But this is all pretty much anecdotal. I showed you a bunch of screenshots. And what most of the industry does, and I will admit that we have done it as well, is they just go out there and they count stuff. Right? So we wrote a paper in 2007, and we got a lot of praise for it. And it was a crappy paper. All right? We literally just went onto these underground forums and said, we saw this this much. We saw that this much. And that's not data. I mean, it is data, but it's not information. <laughs> So uh, just because you can count stuff doesn't mean you actually know what's going on and what the business model is and who's making money and who's losing money. Um, and so the, the, what has driven us in this time going forward is try to actually measure the business model. And to do that, to get ground truth, you actually need to engage with the bad guy usually. And this is something uh, that does create challenges for a researcher. Right? It requires both creativity and patience, a really good legal staff, um, and uh, a lot of attention paid to details that you normally don't pay attention to in computer science because you don't have to worry about uh, you know, what are the consequences of coming up with a new caching algorithm. Um, it's, you, you don't have to hire a Moldovan translator for that. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, a, couple, a few examples of things that we have done in this space. Uh, and, uh, and then at the end, I'll, I'll take questions. So think of, your, think of your questions. All right, so first, let's look at the business model for spam. It's an incredibly simple business model. It's the same as the Sears catalog. All right, so it is direct marketing. If the delivery cost 
to deliver the advertisement to you is less than the conversion rate, that is the probability that someone upon receiving one of these will actually buy a product, times the marginal revenue pr uh, per product, um, then you're gonna make money, right? Because the right-hand side of this equation is the revenue you're taking in, the left-hand side is your cost, revenue is greater than costs, bingo, you're making money. So some of these, we know how much they are. Um, for the delivery cost to send spam, we can either measure it in terms of our seat of the pants estimate, well, if I was gonna write a botnet, here's how much I think it would cost me to write it in terms of time, all right? And so you, prevailing wage and whatever uh, labor market you think is going on. The other thing is you can just go and purchase it, like go rent the spam bot and say, how much would you charge me? And what you find out is that if you're on kind of the spot retail market for spam delivery, it's about $60 per million uh, delivered. Um, marginal revenue is also easy. Uh, let's take one, the most popular spam product, which is pharmaceuticals. Um, because they have open uh, commission programs where you get paid a commission on the basis of uh, bringing in a customer that are about 50%, let's say. The average sale is in the neighborhood of, uh, let's say, $100 plus or minus. So we know what the marginal revenue is. The tricky part is who clicks on this stuff and how often does that actually happen for you to put this thing through. So uh, the way that we approach this problem uh, and th when we started this, no one actually knew the answer to this question except for the spammers. So uh, botnets had become increasingly more sophisticated, and they did so by making the command and control apparatus by which they, uh, they controlled the bots increasingly distributed. And so they, in fact, they used DHTs, right? Um, so this was the big success story for the peer-to-peer -peer movement is that we made really good botnets. Uh, which is exactly what it was for. It was for resilience and survivability and so forth. Um, now the downside of this is that um, the bad guys have a trust problem because they have to trust that when they compromise your machine that your machine will faithfully execute their malware, that you will not act maliciously towards their malware. Uh, and they have no way to know that. They have to trust that you will execute their malware faithfully. So having acquired their malware, you are free to modify it and it will no longer be um, operating the way that they think it will be operating. And that potentially, because of this distributed command and control, allows you to observe what's going on and potentially influence the action. So, so in fact, this is what we did. We uh, infiltrated the Storm peer-to-peer -peer botnet sometime around 2008, and we arranged to poison about 1% of all of the URLs that they commanded bots to spam, uh, such that we were able to then directly measure the delivery probability, the click-through rate, and the conversion rate. And I'll walk through a little bit about how that, uh, how that happened. So the way Storm was organized in a hierarchical fashion, there were really three classes of bots. Proxy bots and worker bots were basically made of machines like yours and mine that were compromised. Master servers were in bulletproof locations in um, the Bay Area. Uh, and so when a worker started up, it would use a DHT, in fact, it used a version of Overnet, would contact a proxy, saying I'm ready to spam, the proxy would send it up to one of the master servers, the master server would come back and hand this pile of goo, which is basically a little programming language for making spam messages. This is the way spam works. They have little programming languages in order to create the polymorphism that they need so that they, you can't have an exact match filter to filter out the spam. And so in there are these little things like names, domains, pharma links that are supposed to be expanded with external data. So the bot master will also say, here's who you should send to. This is the list of people I want you to spam to. Here's who it should be from. And here are the domains that I want you to stick in the body that I w I'm trying to advertise. Okay, so, and then each one of those bots upon receiving this will, will send out different variants uh, taking stuff out of that list. All spam works this way pretty much, all botnet based spam. All right, so what we arranged to do is we managed to take over, rather we infected ourselves with proxy bots, and we arranged to rewrite the messages that came in and out of us, such that when a bot sent a, uh, I am ready to send spam message, we forwarded it on along, just as we would have if we were uh, unknowingly infected. But when the bot master comes back and says, when you send the spam, advertise these domains, we gave them some different domains, right? So UCSD has the uh, inglorious honor of probably being the only uh, campus that had its own Viagra site uh, <laughs> that was active. Uh, and so in fact, when those sites spam, they said exactly the same spam they always would have sent. No additional spam gets sent, but the domain, the, the URLs that were embedded there and were different. And they, um, they pointed to 
one of two sites, one that was an exact replica of the uh, pharmacy site, and another one, this was a, uh, an e-card site that was designed to compromise your computer. That was something else that they were doing. And we replicated everything on the site, including tracking the shopping card and what they tried to order and so forth, up until the point where you had to put in your credit card. And then we gave them an error because my lawyer tells me that the body of law involved with collecting their credit card numbers was far more vol voluminous than she wanted to read. <laughs> so, uh, so then you can actually break the whole thing down. You know, let's just look at the top line there. This is uh, uh, 347 million spam messages that were attempted to be sent. And what you find out first is a whole bunch of them don't even get delivered. So 75% do not even make it to the uh, mail server. The mail transfer agent says, go away. And this is the success of blacklisting, right? Their IP addresses were already tainted. We dropped them on the floor. Another uh, set, I'm not going to talk about this part, we get filtered by spam filters. And then out of that 347 million, you get 10,500 people who actually come and visit your site uh, after you get rid of all the security companies who like to visit your site too. Uh, and then out of all those people, 28 actually tried to put stuff in their shopping cart and check out. All right, so 12 million attempted uh, emails for one purchase. Um, the other one that's a little bit scary, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but there was this other one where we asked, uh, this is exactly what they were doing, you had to uh, run an executable. And the, there was a lure that said like, a friend has sent you an e-card. And uh, the sad part here was that if someone actually uh, came to the site, uh, one in 10 people will run it. And it doesn't matter, uh, every antivirus known to man was the, calling our, our stuff malware, even though it did nothing. Uh, and Microsoft was saying don't run this. Everything would say don't run this. One in 10 people will run it, right? And this is one of the many reasons why an axiomatic basis to security is not gonna work, right? Because one in 10 people will run anything if given the mild lure of uh, there's an April Fool's joke, run this. So, okay. So then we can go and actually estimate what's the value of these purchases, because we have all of the site information. So it comes out to about $100 a day, $140 a day when it was, the site was active, uh, or when spamming was active. We uh, saw about 1.5%, so if we extrapolate, and you should like, be extremely nervous when you hear that word, when we extrapolate, that should, like, it should roughly translate to you to like, tell untruths. Um, <laughs> That would come out to uh, seven to ten thousand dollars a day, and that part is not as bad as the next extrapolation, which is if that happened all year, uh, it would be about three million dollars a year. Now, an interesting thing here is so that comes to about at a fifty percent uh, commission. That's about one and a half million dollars a year revenue for this one campaign, in spite of the fact that you know like twelve million to get one conversion. <laughs> um, on the other hand, if they had paid retail for the spamming, they would have lost money. All right. Uh, now, in fact, the, this outfit did not. Um, pay retail, they owned the botnet. So this was, this was a money-making activity. We don't know exactly what their costs were, but there were, it, was, it had to be a hell of a lot less than $60 uh, uh, per million. Um, a lot of caveats here, this is one example, one time. There are a couple of methodological problems that I can go into, but this gives you some sense of the scale for one spammer. Now, what impacts this value for the spammer? If they wanted to increase more, get more money, what are the various things that impact that? Well, one is there's the cost structure. Can you get the delivery cost down? Can you get your support cost down? What's the size of the available market? So the number of people who want to buy Viagra presumably is not 100%. So if you had a product that was, had wider uh, interest, and this is why fake antivirus is so successful, because fear is a really good product. Like it, if, it, it has a very broad base, and so if you put up something saying, hey, your machine is infected, you need to buy our antivirus product, probably a lot more successful than pharmaceuticals. But then the last thing is deliverability, all right? So remember I said 75% got dropped at the first hop, so you're losing, you know, you're losing three-fourths of your investment right there. So people invest in better ways of getting deliverability. So this is a little excerpt from the accounting package of a botnet, all right? Um, and it's a botnet that is then being rented to others. And so they list in Quatlus, we'll ignore what the units actually are, how much it costs to deliver mail in different ways. So it's basically one unit, if you're just gonna, you take a raw bot and you will send. It's a 2x for what's called no RBL, basically it's not on um, a blacklist, so it's, it has not yet been blacklisted. Um, it can be uh, another 10 to 20 times more 
if you basically run through some, I have compromised your SMTP proxy at your organization, and so I will use your passwords to route my outbound mail so that it appears to leave out of Harvard or it appears to leave out of Columbia. And that will cost me 20 times more. It'll cost me 100 times more to run out of webmail. Right? Webmail is the gold standard for deliverability because we cannot blacklist Hotmail. So the single best tool that we have for dealing with uh, spam is absolutely impotent when it comes to webmail because there's just everyone uses webmail and it's this big monolithic thing. So webmail is really valuable. Uh, this means that you need a lot of accounts because the webmail guys realize that this is happening and they shut this stuff down. So you want automated web account creation tools and that gets us to our next topic. Um, so all of these free services, webmail, AOL, Amazon, what have, oh, oh, Amazon's not a good example, uh, Facebook, but ultimately, what it, they are driven by advertising revenue, all right? And so you get a free mail account. You don't pay any money. And the premise, the reason that this is not just like a tremendous lose is that you assume that each user who signs up is actually a person, right? Advertisements work. This is the ads work assumption, right? If you are giving accounts to people who, on whom ads don't work, like, if they are inanimate objects getting accounts, then you are no longer making money on them because they can never purchase something and you can't sell the right to uh, their eyeballs to somebody else. So what this means is that these free resources, in fact, have value. It's just the value is being monetized through a circuitous route. The bad guys know this too, so I can take an email account and I can use it for spam or blog posts or search engine optimization or what have you. And so this creates the incentive to create um, in an automatic fashion, millions of fake accounts, what's called web service abuse, which is a huge problem uh, for this industry. So, enter Louis Van An, says, all right, we're gonna have this thing called a CAPTCHA. Actually, uh, the CAPTCHAs first came, uh, were invented by the Alta Vista guys, um, but they didn't have a catchy phrase. Uh, at any rate, CAPTCHA basically is one of those obnoxious looking things that, uh, that you have to recognize and type in. And the premise is there are things that humans can recognize, albeit with some grumbling, but that the state of the art with what we know how to do with computer vision or signal processing or what have you does not allow us to do them at scale. So now with your free account sign up, you get something like this, and you're supposed to type it in. All right, so do captures work? Are they a good idea? All right, how would we, how would we think about this? As I said before, we don't know how to measure security. We don't have like quatloos of security. This will give me plus six on the security roll. You know, we don't have any of this. So, um, so what are we gonna do? And so what, one of the nice things, the bad guys help us, right? And the bad guys help us because now that it is valuable to, for them, they have created a market. And I can use the market price to basically say how, how well it works. As the price goes up, that means it's working better. As the price goes down, it's working less well. Um, and so there are a bunch of different ways this gets solved. You have software solvers that use uh, machine vision to automatically recognize this stuff. And you have humans sitting there typing in captures all day. Um, and so we can think of, the way we can think of a captcha is it's the cost on the balance sheet of some scammer that they need to incur uh, and it's a drag on their business. So how do you do this? You engage with the solver market. You find all these people who are offering solvers and you say, I would like to have a couple hundred thousand captures solved, please, uh, and see how well that works. And you can do it on the other side by getting in as a laborer and say, I would like to work all day and night solving captures. All right, so how much is a capture worth? By the way, everything, every single thing in the underground economy is valued in units of a thousand. That's just something I've learned over time. It's like, it's one of the rules. All right, so retail cost to solve a thousand captures. Anyone? One dollar, one dollar, someone over there got it, all right. One dollar to solve a thousand captures, and actually wholesale cost can be, can be 50 cents, so why is it so cheap? So we thought about this, well, it's because we have computing. It's the impact of automation. They can just turn this stuff, so what? You don't get a great success rate on recognition. Computing is so cheap, hell, you can probably go to Amazon and run it on EC2 and still make money on the solving captures. All right, so it turns out that software solving works. We have really good optical character recognition. We do segmentation. You add a little heuristics. You can solve anyone's CAPTCHA with some investment in a computer vision person to plug those three things together and make it work. This has been going on since people invented CAPTCHAs. Right? As soon as people came up with CAPTCHAs, the machine vision people said, well, 
That's a problem for us. Good. You've, you've justified our existence. All right. So here is a, here's an interesting fact. Technically, you can do this. It works. All right. It is absolutely unsuccessful as a business. This is not how it works. All right. And why might that be? All right. So you can make it work, but it is not profitable to do it. All right. So if we consider like the traditional arms race, we have a, uh, a relationship between the adversary and the good guy. So the bad guy's job is to obfuscate. This is true for spam, antivirus. Their job is to make it hard for the defender to recognize the thing. The good guy has to recognize the thing. Recognition, and this goes back to like when you had your theory class. Recognition problems are always harder. All right? So it's always harder to recognize the thing than it is to mess it up and make it uh, different than it was the last time. So in the traditional problem, it's really easy for me to make a new version of a piece of malware. I'll encrypt it a little bit. I'll change the order of instructions. I'll do something. And it's a huge pain in the butt for me to actually recognize that. Favor, you know, advantage to the bad guy. Captures, we've reversed the roles. So the good guy now, their job is to obfuscate. They make this awful capture thing we have to solve. And the bad guy has the recognition task. The recognition task is um, tough. It's really tough to solve a captcha as well as humans do. And it's really cheap for the provider to switch captchas, right? They change that piece of code that perturbs the thing. So unless you know how to build a solver that can solve every captcha, not solve like Yahoo's captcha now, but solve Yahoo's captcha for all time, no matter what they would do with it, um, you have a problem if the provider can quickly switch their captcha. In fact, Microsoft has switched their captcha like five or six times. And it absolutely kills the, uh, uh, the market for software solvers. So what happens is that the time value, the investment that you put into making the software solver is low because the good guy can change easily. So just a thought experiment. Suppose it's $10,000 for you to solve a, uh, to build a, a software solver. You get about 20% accuracy. That's typical for these solvers, solvers for like reCAPTCHA or the, uh, the uh, Microsoft CAPTCHA. Human labor is going about 50 cents per thousand uh, in bulk. So for you to break even against paying humans to do it, you have to attempt 100 million CAPTCHAs, solving 20%, without being noticed and having them change the CAPTCHA on you just to do as well. All right? And anyone who stewards their CAPTCHA in any reasonable fashion will notice if you are having huge failure rates and will switch their CAPTCHA, undermining your investment. And so basically, everyone tried this, and by and large, except for the companies who don't change their CAPTCHA, which there are some, <laughs> um, uh, this is not an effective business strategy. All right, so human solving. This emerges in 2006. You have things, uh, there are all these freelancer sites. I don't know if people are familiar with the freelancer industry, but basically you can pay money for anything, right? Just like do my homework, write a code that does this, send 100 spams on my behalf, anything you want. And these guys came up and said, hey, can you solve some captures? Is there anyone who would solve some captures for me? And so what happens is this is actually, having humans solve captures is a really powerful attack because it sidesteps the assumptions of captures, right? It's, it is humans. Captures are supposed to differentiate between humans and computers, and they're working, right? And it's just that we bought humans. Um, it doesn't require any skill. You have to be able to recognize, you know, Roman characters. That's about it. Uh, so you can outsource it really easily to any place that has internet access, and you can aggregate it, right? You don't have to have one guy solve them. You can have 10 guys, 100 guys, and then you can create a service around that aggregation. So you get a retail service, and as you might suspect, market pressure caused the price to go down. So 2006, it was about $10 to, uh, per thousand. By 2009, it goes down to $1 per thousand, 75 cents 2010. Here's a really sad post. This is just before Christmas <laughs> in 2009 at a solving site in China. Uh, it's called typethat.biz. And this is a note from the administrators of this site to the human laborers who are working there. And they say, as you can see, the server was unstable. We couldn't get enough business from you know, basically retail business because our, price, our retail prices are not competitive with our, uh, with our competitors, and so we're going to have to drop our prices and drop prices to you, and so Merry Christmas, but on Tuesday, your, what you paid is going to be reduced, and sure enough, it gets reduced from $1 per thousand for them to 75 cents per thousand uh, a week later. And right, so here's the way this works. You want to solve a whole bunch of things. You have a piece of software that scrapes sites. You want to sign up for Twitter, let's say. 
it scrapes that little piece of text there that says uh, bought joysticks. And there are tons of people who will sell you software. UBOT is a very configurable one that will do this scraping. It then will um, be configured to talk to a um, capture solving uh, retail front end that has an API that uses you know, SOAP or HTTP. You provide the image to them. And then uh, and you've, you have an account. They, in turn, will uh, provide this to their back end site, which is advertised under a different brand called PixProfit in this case, um, that has recruited people to sign up uh, and uh, solve captures in the privacy of their own home or cafe or what have you. Um, and then it is farmed out with a bunch of queues. And some of them understand queuing better than others, it turns out. Uh, but to people around the world who are willing to do this for money, one of them gets this. They type in the right answer. They send, so they've taken an image, they've turned it into an ASCII string, it gets sent back through the same chain, and now you have that available and can uh, type it in. And so this happens at, at massive scale. So um, we went and just paid for an enormous number of captures. I mean, you have, like, for, like, what's in your wallet? You can pay for captures for the rest of the day. It's just amazing. Um, and so what you find is that these people do really, really well, right? And why should we be surprised? They do it all day, right? They're pretty good. So basically, um, everyone does better than 20% error rate, which is actually better for most of these captures than um, normal people. Uh, basically, we took everyone's captcha. We'd like, I don't know, 25 different captures and threw them at these sites and then checked uh, against uh, ground truth. And um, uh, the good ones get down to 10 to 14%. And at the response time, they're basically, you're not going to be detecting this stuff by variance in response time because this is every bit as good as real humans, right? So like the additional, 100 millisecond round trip time to Asia is not going to be a detectable uh, feature. One worker, we have learned, can do between one and two and a half thousand captures per eight hour shift. Um, so then we went and said, well, how many workers do these guys have? And so the way you do this is you just send them more and more captures to solve until they can't solve anymore. So we cornered the market on capture service for a short period of time in order to do this experiment and looked at a bunch of these different things. And so um, what you, what you uh, conclude, looking at the rate at which one can solve a CAPTCHA, is that they have a crap load of people doing this. So Antigate, which um, backs up one of the, uh, it's one of the uh, service providers for Hroomer and a bunch of the other really popular tools, at any given time has four to 500 people solving this stuff. So aggregate capacity is in you know, millions per day. We also managed to hunt down one of the operators of this service, and. Um, they agreed to do an interview with us. Um, so that, then there's more about this in, in the paper, but basically they, they, he explained the whole business model, and then they have a, I mean, it's, it's fairly sophisticated. They have a fixed set of people that are on staff, but then they can call more temp labor in if they get big jobs, and it's just like any other, it's just like any other outsourcing business, all right? And we did some more work if you're curious about where the labor markets are and, and so on and so forth. But, so getting back to our capture question, captures work, well, they differentiate between humans and computers. Absolutely. Do they prevent large-scale abuse? Well, no. We have millions of these things being compromised. But, all right, so what, in, in taking a step back, the way to think about this is not that CAPTCHA is a binary defense that either it protects you or it doesn't. It is a filter. It is a drag, all right? And so what this ends up doing is, if you don't have the CAPTCHA, abuse explodes, because it means that people who have bad business plans can afford to abuse your resource. What CAPTCHAs do effectively is they keep the, your abusers to the small set of people who have efficient business models and can actually afford the cost that that CAPTCHA friction adds uh, on their balance sheet. And that dramatically reduces the set of people that you have to deal with. And what it also means is that you now, the much more expensive things you might do to hunt down web service abuse, like doing phone verification or having a team that tries to detect these things can be limited to a much smaller group of people and most of your account holders actually don't need to be bothered with that stuff. All right, so the thing that I told you I was gonna talk about is what we're gonna do about spam. This is kind of the, the last part. So we've talked about a few different uh, aspects here but there are a lot of pieces. So we've got the botnet delivery and the registrars and hosting and customer support and there's credit card companies. Where should we actually act if we were going to do something? And so that was uh, what our most recent effort is focused on. 
And uh, so in order to understand this, though, I first I'm going to walk you through how a spam gets monetized. And this is actually an, a real example, not a hypothetical example. So we divide this up into the value chain for spam into three phases. There's the advertisement phase. That's the thing that gets you a link in front of your eyes. And it could be email. It could be web abuse. It could be search engine abuse. It doesn't matter. But for, in this case, it's spam. So in, uh, the Grum botnet, in this case, delivered us a spam message for some pharmaceuticals delivered into our inbox. All right, phase one is over. Now we are one of those users who decide, oh, yeah, sure, I'll buy that, and they click. A whole bunch of other things need to happen. That domain needs to have been registered. So they need a, a registrar who will have supported it. In this case, the, it's reg.ru um, out of Russia. There needs to be an NS record that actually hosts a um, name service for that. In this case, uh, the uh, name server for uh, uh, MedicShop RX is located in China. The A record um, for the host happens to be a compromised machine in Brazil. That machine is not, in fact, a web server. It's a web service proxy that pulls back from an affiliate program in Russia where the content and uh, payment processing is actually stored, who has contracted with an Azerbaijani bank who will then receive your, uh, your Visa card payment. And then, upon getting a settlement on that, has arranged with a manufacturer in India who will then drop ship you um, goods. And so, after the advertising, there's this, the second phase that we call click support, that's making sure that you can get to the shop, and the final phase being realization, taking your money and then providing you a product, and the customer support that goes along with that. All right. So if we were to break these down into these three phases, the responsible parties differ. So advertising is always done by the spammer. We'll call the affiliate. I'll explain in a moment. Click support is sometimes done by them as well. Um, the affiliate program always owns the realization phase. They own payment processing, uh, uh, fulfillment, uh, customer service, all of that. And they frequently will provide the click support, too. We're going to focus on these last two, click support and realization, because people have studied the delivery of spam to death. And I don't know if we have very much to add there. All right. Briefly, affiliate programs. Um, six, seven years ago, spammers did everything soup to nuts. You would buy. Uh, a link from an ISP, you would buy some products, you'd keep them in your basement, you would actually put them in envelopes and ship them out. You know, that was, that was the, old, the old economy. The new economy is much more efficient. Uh, and so we have broken this down into lines of business. The affiliate programs effectively provide a franchise model where advertisers work as free agents on a commission basis. So the franchise program provides the content, web templates, advertising literature to go in the emails. They provide the payment services. They provide the fulfillment. fulfillment they do customer service. Um, they manage all of, all of the business back-end relationships. And they allow the spammers to concentrate on what they do best, which is spamming. Um, it also means they have pushed off the risk and decoupled themselves from the source of innovation needed to deliver advertising. So they don't care how you get the message out there. Right? You could advertise on TV. They could care less. If you bring people to their site, they will pay you a commission. And it's one of these let a thousand flowers bloom. There, at any given one of these affiliate programs, there may be a thousand different affiliates all trying something. Most of them don't make very much money. Some of them make it big. And so they don't have to worry about investing in the wrong solution because they don't carry that risk. All right. So here's a, a typical affiliate program, RX Promotion. It advertises, look, we have 30 to 60% commissions on sales, on-demand payments. They have a nice little iPhone app where you can arrange to have stuff transferred into your web money account. Load, they advertise, we have, really, we have the market leading prices on Viagra at 77 cents per pill. You can run your own shop. So they'll give you a whole bunch of different shop choices for what the, basically this is what the storefront looks like. So you see all these different storefronts, and you might think these are different uh, outfits. They're not. All right? These are all different brands for the same organization. So they understand branding. All right? So there are different brands for different target markets, and you may specialize in going after you know, the elderly, the young, different kinds of drugs, and still have different storefronts for that kinds of activity. All right. So uh, the last, uh, the most recent project we've done, we said, look, let's try to go through this thing soup to nuts and figure out where are the bottlenecks in the value chain. And by bottlenecks, I mean if you were to intervene, there are all these resources that are required to make a click work. Every single one of those things need to happen. If any one of those didn't happen, they don't make money on that piece of email. So if I were to take resources out at any one of those tiers, where would I need to eliminate the smallest number of resources to have the most impact? And where will there be the fewest alternatives for the bad guy to turn to and the highest switching costs? So if I get rid of this for them, it will cause them the most pain, and it will be the hardest for them to replace with something else. And we're going to try to measure it empirically. 
Um, and we're going to do this by being a customer writ large. So we are going to be a customer at tremendous scale. And we're going to focus on three of the most popular domains, which is pharmaceuticals, replica products like Rolex watches and so forth, and software. All right. So um, there are a bunch of uh, phases here. We get feeds from a lot of different uh, people, uh, Barracuda Networks, Abusics, a bunch of people who uh, prefer we don't use their name. But we get a lot of spam. All right. And so we pull this in as well as we, we run a whole bunch of bots in a contained environment. So we see everything that all the major botnets are sending as well. We extract all of the URLs out of every piece of spam. Um, then we go and we have two different crawlers, one that looks at the DNS infrastructure. So for every one of those, we pervasively crawl. We crawl its uh, f uh, fully qualified domain, its registered domain. We do it repeatedly to, make, to deal with fast flux. Every piece of infrastructure, NSA records, glue records, this thing crawls until there's nothing left to be crawled. Then the web crawler gets online, and it goes to the page, downloads the page, saves the HTML, renders the page, saves the DOM, saves a screenshot of what it looked like. So this is everything that a, a user would have witnessed and all of the kind of attendant metadata. Then we take all of that web data, and we cluster it together um, based on like content. So is the HTML similar? That lets us put all of those ultimate replica pages. All of these URLs all led to the same kind of site. Um, and then we do what we call content tagging. That is to take all those different uh, storefronts that are the same and identify that they're all part of the same program. And this last part was just incredibly painstaking. A lot of uh, basically work hanging out on the underground, finding out who's running what sites, until we created this enormous list of regular expressions. And we basically, for these categories, you don't have to read any of this, but we cover every major affiliate program. So th there's no one major who's spamming for whom we can't recognize that it's their, that it's their program. OK. So from that, then uh, the part that's a little different, then we start buying stuff, too. Um, and so we are also unique in being one of the few, I think, university organizations buying drugs with the permission of their administration. Uh, and so why, why would we do that aside from the laugh that you get to get in exchange for saying it at a conference? So it's because the other things lots of people have looked at, but the realization part, the payment processing part, and the fulfillment part, you have no insight into unless you actually complete a transaction. And so you get payment information. In our case, we cut a deal with a card issuer. So we have our own credit cards that allow us to track all of the information about that transaction. So we find out what's called the bank identification number of the acquiring bank. I'll explain what that is in a second. The particular merchant identifier and terminal identifier, the category code that it's advertising. Basically, are they honoring the transaction and which banks are helping them? And then on the fulfillment side, we get to find out, for example, do you get anything? When you buy this spam advertised stuff, do you get anything? Um, and is it what you thought it was? Where is it shipped from? What's the contents? And so forth. So really briefly, I'm going to explain credit cards, because it's going to be important for um, the last uh, few minutes. Um, when you buy something, and this has nothing to do with spam, this is Amazon too, when you're a customer and you want to place an order from some merchant, he will tell them, I authorize you to charge my card for the latest copy of Harry Potter. And um, the merchant then takes that, and they have a relationship with a bank, which is called the acquiring bank, who is part of some card association network. And you will, they will send an authorization request to them. The acquiring bank then goes to the Visa network. This is very much like the internet, except for money. Uh, and they will go back to the issuing bank, which is basically the bank who gave you your credit card. You can think of the issuing bank as representing consumers, and the acquiring bank as representing the merchant's interests. If the issuing bank says, yes, they have that money, and yes, I approve that purchase, that purchase is for something that I'm willing to have them pay for, the approval process goes back. The merchant then sends a receipt. You have a settlement process, and the money is transferred. And then your credit card transaction has been completed. But the point is, there are five entities involved in making this work. You, your bank, the card association network, the acquiring bank, and the merchant. And there may be, actually, there may be more, because between the merchant and the acquiring bank, there's frequently a payment processor who handles the technical details. OK. So buying, we now have, we have our, the project lead, uh, Kira Levchenko. And uh, Chris Kane is director of purchasing. And so we bought a lot of stuff. And we bought multiple things from every affiliate program so we could verify that they had consistent uh, information, that we get the same thing every time we order from them, even if we go through different, uh, different sites. And you know what? You do get something. You always get something, almost without exception. Right? Every time you place one of these orders, eventually you get something. If it's software, you get pointed to some online site and you download something. And 
If it's, if, if it's pharmaceuticals, you know you get a package, typically from India for uh, pharmaceuticals, herbal products, typically from the United States. They are, uh, they are what, what I would say is w when we have done tests against reference samples, they are not exactly the same, but they are pretty similar. All right, so we did mass spec on a couple of our things, and you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't junk. That's not to say it's not junk sometimes. In our case, it hasn't been junk. The software is the software. It doesn't have viruses in it, it doesn't have malware. Um, can't tell you anything about the herbal stuff. Uh, and the watches are cheap replica watches, which is exactly what they claim they are. All right, so, so there you go. Um, all right, so there's one little story I want to tell. It's a little funny. So the, the people who do, who, who do the drop shipping, um, part of what they compete on is their ability to actually get through U.S. Customs, all right? Because if you don't deliver, then, then I will ask for a refund, uh, and you will give me the refund. By the way, if you call a spam advertised merchant and you say, I don't like what I got or I didn't get it, um, you will always get a refund. They have be far better customer service than any <laughs> business you have ever dealt with. And there's a very good reason. And the reason is they don't want the chargebacks. Because if you go to your bank, your bank and then say, I want a chargeback, that goes against the balance sheet of their acquirer. If the chargeback rate goes above 1%, then Visa gets on their case. So they will always give you a refund. All right. So they really want this stuff to make it through customs. So this is one time we ordered some pills from one outfit, and we got this from Bangladesh. And I don't even know what this is. It's like a little textile thing. And then we noticed it was a little lumpy. And so you <laughs> cut it away. <laughs> And they have secreted the pills inside this, this painting that they, um, that they sent us. So this was how they guaranteed that they made it through customs. By the way, over the course of this and other studies, we've done maybe 400 uh, purchases. And I'd say five or six have been intercepted by customs, which I, I will say in my talks with FDA, they were very happy that they got five or six. Um, <laughs> so in summary, we looked at three months of this stuff, about a billion URLs. Uh, about 17 million unique domains. We crawled domains that covered 98% of the URLs. We had this huge cluster, thousands of Firefox instances basically going off and doing all this crawling. We had to have incredibly wide IP diversity because we start getting blacklisted. So we have uh, like eight different slash 24 ranges, uh, multiple purchases from all the program. Let's put it all together. So we're going to say, all right, let's look at interventions in the click support tier, either at registrars or hosting, and at the real realization side on payments, are there any bottlenecks? So let's look at registrars. So they, in order to get you to these sites, they need a domain name, right? Very few people click on those ones that are just IP addresses. So you need a domain name to click on. Some registrar needs to give it to you. So let's look at all the sites that advertise pharma, replica, or software. 34% are registered out of NowNet, right? NowNet is a well-known Russian registrar um, who seems to be very familiar uh, to a number of these people, then additional uh, 11% each from a, a few registrars in China, then the diversity goes off into forever. There's a gazillion people who will do some of this stuff. So you could say, look, well, look, there's 34% in NowNet. We could just take them down. We'd kill 34%. That's actually only part of the answer. You could, and people have done things like that. The problem is that you have so many people playing in this game, and the switching costs, you know, in bulk, domains are a dollar a piece or less. The switching cost is so low that it's very, very hard to actually have any kind of lasting impact here. So there's a paper that we did at LEAP where we looked at the impact of two different efforts to do this, like China raised the price of .cn by, by you know, 100x. And so what happens? They switch to .ru, and they do it very, very quickly, and no one loses any money. All right, so let's look at hosting. Hosting, you see, uh, you know, again, there's some, some kind of concentration. Evolva out of Romania is pretty big. Um, ChinaNet does a fair amount of web hosting, but it, none of them really dominate. And there are a huge number of alternatives. Switching cost is really low. Again, if you think about it, this hosting doesn't need to be kind of brick and mortar hosting. It can be on those botnets, which I told you were a dime a piece for the high quality US hosts. So this is also going to be problematic. So let's look at the payment side. OK, so three banks cover everything pretty much. 95% were getting monetized, 60, 65% out of Azeri Gaz Bank in uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, and that's basically almost all pharmaceuticals. Uh, the National Bank of St. Kitts and Nevis basically did all herbal products and replicas. DNB Nord did some additional pharmaceuticals and software. Um, and so th here, switching cost is a bigger deal, because there are not as many banks who want to handle really high-risk merchants. Switching costs, you actually have to meet someone to create a merchant account. There is an exchange of documentation, visa, signed certificates. Um, it is a, you know, light speed in this space is like five days, 
right, to create a new one of these accounts. So these are expensive resources, and when they get shut down, all of these guys have what's called um, holdbacks, which means they want to hold, say, $100,000 of yours, and if things go, in case things go bad, and if you get shut down, then they just keep that money. Right? So these are far more expensive, harder to replace resources. So given this, there are things you could do. You could, there's, you know, in, in the computer security model, there's the takedown approach. You go after the acquiring banks and make them stop, and that's probably hard in, in Azerbaijan because they're not breaking any laws in Azerbaijan. Um, maybe you could use shame. You could negotiate. I mean, there have been a... So, you know, U.S. government put a huge amount of pressure to try to get Russia to not do payment processing for all of MP3. And after four years, they were successful. Um, so another way you might do this is to focus on the consumer banks, the issuing banks in the United States. Reason being, 85% of all the money that funds this stuff comes from the United States. The United States is where it's illegal, right? There's... The place where the laws are being broken is here, and the place where the uh, order is taking place is here. There are um, about eight banks that supply the majority of U.S. Visa and MasterCards uh, for the entire U.S. So if they were to choose to not do card not present, that means internet, transactions with a Zeri Gaz bank for 5912 pharmaceutical purchases, for which it is impossible for me to believe there is even one legitimate example of said purchase, uh, it, would, it would demonetize this. And, but what's really important isn't that, hey, you only need to do, have them do it with a few banks. It's that there's a, a speed asymmetry here. Think about five days to get a new bank. The time to update one of these blacklists is the time to make an order and see that, um, that uh, bank identification number, which is about five seconds, uh, and then you're there. So you have like an eight order of magnitude speed advantage should you decide that this was important enough to exert some policy will. And this is about where uh, we as computer scientists stop because then it starts getting into the politics stuff that we quickly realized we didn't understand. All right, now the last, I'll leave you two last slides just to give you, a, this is not unique to spam. It's not that this is just true for spam. You can do exactly the same kind of analyses for everything from credentials theft to click fraud. There's a really nice paper from Santa Barbara on how the fake antivirus market works. Um, the print, and the, uh, I'm going to give a plug for Chris Greer's work at Usenix Security uh, in 2011 on paper, the paper install market that I was talking about, which he's thoroughly infiltrated. Uh, the challenge is actually coming up with the methodology, but that's exactly the kind of thing that our community is good at, is figuring out how to measure a thing that you're not allowed to measure directly through some combination of inference and smarts and, and invariants that you discover. Um, all right. So I'm going to summarize up kind of the work that we do these days is driven by two beliefs. One, that we should embrace a security regime that's fundamentally data-driven as opposed to driven by uh, imagination. Um, and that uh, if we're going to be spending our security, you know, our limited security dollars effectively, we can't just be victims that have abstract adversaries, but we need to reason about both the economic and social structure of our adversaries so that what we do has the most impact on what is being done to us. Um, and then finally, that this is something that's totally achievable. I think when we started this, we didn't think it was achievable, and we thought, all right, you know, maybe one paper will come out of this and it'll be a one-off. Um, but no, in fact, there's a lot that one can do, and there's a lot more than I was able to talk about. Other groups are getting involved. And what's really nice is it's a place where you can have really meaningful impact instead of just publishing the papers and having the sumo guy kill the little boy. Um, you actually get to do things in which, at the end of the day, there is a reasonable chance of you making uh, the state of affairs better. All right? And so with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks. For maybe a couple questions, if you have questions, uh, please use the mics in the middle. Yeah. Hello. So I had this, uh, I, I've read once this crazy idea that in order to, you know, battle the spam, you can just charge for sending email messages. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there is such a dangerous perils on the internet these days, maybe this crazy idea is not as crazy anymore. I'm sorry, what was the last part of the question? It's just like pretty much whether it will, where do you think uh, email messages will be charged? or not, you know, for So I, I think, so the, the model of charging for email has been around for a really long time, and there's, there's a very interesting technical debate about whether you can make the thing work in the face of botnets and so forth, and I tend to fall on the side of it's unlikely to make it work uh, because, you know, they're not using their machines to send the messages, but I understand you could rate limit what each individual machine can send and so forth. 
I think that the other problem you have is it, ha it has the anti-network effect. You really need to get everyone to do it. And so that makes it very hard. Um, so it's, it's one of those ideas that I don't know how you get people to start at. Um, and, and that's, and that's you know, it's one of those classic deployment challenges, you know, chicken or egg things. There's an interesting, I think, technical debate to be had about whether you can do it, but then there's a much bigger, I think, kind of reality debate about what it would take to get that out there in mail servers. Hi, John Osterhout from Stanford. So at the risk of sounding terribly naive, uh, just doing the math in my head, it sounds like people solving these captures are getting paid on the order of a dollar a day. Um, three three dollars because they'll work a bunch of shifts. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And so, but the, and it requires some basic level of literacy. So what you're saying is that no, a, no literacy required. It's just uh, individual character recognition is sufficient, so they can have a yeah. picture of the alphabet in front of them. Yeah, although uh, I think we found that uh, basic English was maybe forty percent, something like that. I mean, a lot of this is China and India. China is the biggest. Uh, and so you need, a, but you don't really need any English. You just need to recognize the characters. What you will find is it'll be big in countries where um, you know this is a little bit better than the uh, minimum wage for textile workers, right? And it's probably a better quality of work. So it's in the same ballpark. It's you. It has moved to the lower lowest labor cost market that um, has internet. Josh Triplett, Portland State University. I was wondering a little bit about how this market feeds into itself. You pointed out you could buy credit card numbers for 2 to $4. Uh, potentially, they might even work. And I'm wondering, could you not then use that to pay for more such services, or is there a large extraction and laundering problem? To what extent can they not just turn that exponential to the size of the market? That's a great question. So um, the, by and large, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement bereft of any data here. All right, so be careful. But by and large, I will argue that for financial credentials theft, the bottleneck is in cash out. All right, because to cash out at scale, one credit card is not an issue. All right, but you can't scale one credit card. You need you know, hundreds of credit cards or hundreds of bank accounts. And so then you need, then you have a money laundering problem. How do you get that money back into your hands? And so today. The principal way that is done is through mule networks. So I will, if, you, if you were to ever post that you're out of work on monster.com, and then you get an email saying, we have work at home work for you as an international support engineer, um, and then it will be explained to you that, yes, because of banking you know, laws, our bank account in the United States hasn't been set up, blah, blah, you will be told, we're going to transfer money into your account, and then we want you to wire it to us via Western Union or MoneyGram. All right, so people, that they will have controllers that basically have whole networks of these people who will transfer the money over. So for, for credit cards, it'll frequently be knowing people. And those are, for credit cards, it's typically actually um, drug addicts uh, who will be sent out given plastic cards and they take stuff out of ATMs. For uh, uh, bank fraud, they'll have people who do, um, they will do wire transfer into these people's bank accounts and then they, via, via the automated clearinghouse, and then they will wire it via Western Union, at which point it's, it's gone. But that's a very expensive asset. And so, in fact, it's challenging to, to bootstrap that way. They, 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 in the long term, you do it, but not, it's not a very easy, it's, it's a very, um, there's a lot of friction in that transaction. So in fact, on the underground, no one pays each other that way. They will use very liquid online currencies like web money and Liberty Reserve um, that are anonymous and are irrevocable, all right? And that's the other problem with credit cards is that they're credit, right? And so you have, you know, using it, still, there's, some, there's various things people do, reshipping fraud, but it's heavyweight. So you don't see very much of what you, what you just described. Thanks. I think we're out of time for questions, so let's thank our speaker again.